Okay, welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, here for a long workshop. And so it's on bioconductor style differential expression analysis powered by Speakeasy. And we have multiple presenters. Diana is listed as the high one. Um, Renee and Nicholas here. Great. So I will turn it over to you and you can arrange things however you want. Is it, oh, and I'll, I'll put it online, but again, this is being, let's go to the other one. If you want to try to follow along, um, I'm going to take that away. Hopefully, it if you workshops.bioconductor.org, and if you search on the left, start type and start BEA, and then hit search, and you should see the one Speakeasy, and it will it should be able to launch for you. And I'll put it on. So you may want to go slow before starting here. People want to try to get on. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, thanks for welcoming us. Um, yeah, so I'm Nick. This is uh, Renee and Diana. And yeah, we'll be presenting on both um, Speakeasy, which is a um, basically a pre-processing pipeline, and then also doing some differential expression on the outputs of it. Um, so we're, just as a heads up, we were having some issues running the um, Galaxy instance uh, earlier. We're not sure if it's going to at all go today, but um, you can always follow along with the vignette, and we may end up doing that depending on how things go. Um, cool. Um, so, um, actually, we'll start with the uh, vignette now. Yep. Um, um, yeah. Um, so, is it, uh, sorry, I don't know. This one? And just in this chat, okay. Um, all right, yeah, so we just dropped the link to the vignette um, in case you want to follow along. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, yeah, so just as an overview, um, so I guess for this, it's not necessary that you follow along. Um, you should be able to follow things if you just um, want to follow along with the vignette, not necessarily run things, but obviously that's up to you. Um, so I guess uh, we'll start, basically, we'll start with the introduction to what Speakeasy is, and then later we will go into um, using a uh, the data set that we'll be using, which is another bioconductor package, and then dive into a differential expression analysis on these outputs. Um, so um, I guess I'll just start with uh, Speakeasy. So yeah, Speakeasy is a um, bulk RNA-seq preprocessing pipeline. Um, and so it's really an entire workflow that starts with the um, fast cues you get from sequencing, and then you end up with there's a lot of processing steps. You end up with these um, summarized experiment objects. So we're we're really bioconductor people. So we were interested in developing a pipeline that um, does all these a lot of the workflow steps involved in RNA seq, and then actually organizing it into this structure we really love, the summarized experiment, um, which enables us to do a lot of like uh, downstream analysis with the bioconductor packages that we are used to using. Um, so there's really, I mean, the workflow is a bit complicated, but essentially it comprises a lot of components. Um, we do some QC steps. So um, we do that with fast QC. We also do optionally trimming. Um, a lot of these steps are configurable. For example, trimming, you can do um, as an optional. So you can say no trimming. You can say, depending on the fast QC metrics, um, or you can trim all samples. So a lot of these things are very uh, configurable. Um, so also alignment to a reference genome. Um, and so we support human, mouse, and rat right now, and you can specify um, basically any gen code or ensemble release. So gen, gen code for human and mouse, uh, ensemble for rat. Um, so all these things are really in a configuration file, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, but ultimately, we quantify a few different types of features. So um, we're counting genes, exons, and uh, exon, exon junctions actually transcripts as well. So many different feature types here that, um, and each of those features actually gets its own summarized experiment object. And in just a bit, I'll show you, like I'll do a, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with summarized experiment, but we'll definitely do a recap to um, show what the structure of things. Um, 
then there's a bunch of other sort of optional steps. Uh, we have, um, actually, I'll just dive into the main outputs for now, um, which are these, I've been talking about these summer, range summarized experiment objects. Um, so the general idea here uh, is a bit, I might make this slightly smaller. Which liner do you guys use before you jump into the Yeah, sure. Um, so we use HiSat. Uh, we also do, like HiSat is the default, or Hi, sorry, HiSat 2. Yeah. Um, and then we also support star. So like you, and if you want to use star instead. Um, we do have like tutorials on how to swap out tools. It's a bit like experimental, but I guess those are the two that we support right now. Those are built in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, by the way, if anyone has questions, just definitely, like this is supposed to be interactive. So definitely feel free to just um, interrupt or just raise your hand or whatever. Um, yeah, so each of these features that we're measuring, genes, exons, junctions, and transcripts, they get their own summarized experiment object in the end. Uh, the basic idea is that you have this, these, um, these matrices of counts that are in this assay slot of the summarized experiment. Um, so the columns here are like your individual samples, and then the rows are um, whatever the feature is. So for genes, it's just like each of your genes is a row. Um, or transcripts, obviously transcripts are the rows. Um, and so that's the main, the core component are these counts. Um, in the rows, you have information about what the rows are. So uh, gene metadata, for example. Um, so like what chromosome it's on, um, uh, yeah, where in the genome it is and other information about like gene IDs, um, stuff like that. Um, call data similarly is like information about your samples um, so each column, there's a lot of QC metrics that we collect during Speakeasy. So things like um, metrics from FastQC or um, from trimming, and then things like alignment rate and um, like mitochondrial percentage and a lot of other interesting things that we will actually interactively dive into um, in the later part of this workshop. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of useful covariates there that we think are good for some like downstream differential expression and stuff like that. Um, the metadata actually in Speakeasy uh, really just has like the um, input settings you use. So any like configuration variables, um, the exact version of Speakeasy you use, it's just stuff like that. Um, but yeah, these, this is really the, the core of what is output from Speakeasy. Uh, there's some um, also, actually let me, Make this a little bigger. Um, some optional things are for humans where you actually do variant calling. So um, one benefit is, of that is that we have basically are doing genotype calls for um, at a list of highly variable sites. Um, and then that enables us to um, identify like sample swap issues or sample identity issues and then perform swaps. Uh, we won't really be talking about how to do that today. Um, we do have a previous um, workshop actually that goes into exactly how you go about doing that. Uh, so that's just sorted for humans only, but um, can be useful potentially. Um, there's also optional, another optional step, I guess, is producing these big wig coverage files that can be used for um, like as a step to, for computing uh, express regions. So if you're interested in computing like differentially express regions, that's like a preliminary step that's necessary. And so that's like one of the options um, it's not run by default, but that's one of the things we support. Um, yeah, so we can move on to like what, how you go about like installing this. So we tried to make this as simple as possible. I guess every software developer claims that their tool is easy to install, right? But um, so uh, basically, we, you just clone the repo we have, um, and then the way we recommend. There's a few different ways you can install Speakeasy. Uh, the way we recommend is through either Docker or, or Singularity. So I think. We envision that a lot of people will be using high performance computing um, environments for their research. So usually Singularity is like the option that will be supported there. So um, yeah, so basically all the dependencies are wrapped into the, these containers that we ho host on Docker Hub. Um, but anyways, that's from the user's perspective, all you really run is just clone the repo and you run this um, shell strip that we have in the repo that just pulls down these containers and um, that's pretty much it. So uh, if you don't have access to Docker or Singularity, we have a more experimental installation method, but that tries to um, basically install every individual dependency on your computer. But that, I mean, there's a lot of variability between people's computer systems. So it's a little bit 
difficult to ensure that is like error free. So we definitely recommend um, Docker and Singularity. Do you have recommendations about what minimum computing requirements are needed to run this? Um, yeah. So um, depending on it, really it depends on the size of your data set, of course. But um, usually, yeah. You need to repeat the question for people online. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot that. Uh, so yeah, we had a question about minimum um, computational requirements for running Speakeasy. Um, so I guess like the. Um, yeah, it depends on the size of your data set, but then usually as small as like 16 gigs or so of memory is sufficient for like smaller data sets. Um, yeah, I, I would say that like we typically use more resources because sometimes you can get like use more. Um, if you use more uh, some tools, when you use more cores, it also requires more memory and then you can run things faster. But I'd say like 16 gigs is probably like a bare minimum. Um, and in terms of computing cores, I think uh, there's really not a lower limit on what you need. It just will run slower if you don't have as many. So, um, and that's we all we have a configuration file for like how much memory and uh, compute cores to use in each step. So, um, yeah, that's all like configurable, and uh, it'll just run slower if you don't have as many resources. But yeah. Um, so yeah, we don't expect people to necessarily install Speakeasy for this workshop. It was just mostly an overview of how to use it, because we'll mostly be focusing on how to use the outputs. Of, um, so um, yeah, um, I guess the two things, once you install, there's like sort of two fi files that you would probably need to edit before you actually run Speakeasy. Um, so that's, we call those like the main script and the config file. Um, the main script is like the, just a sort of a shell script wrapper um, that contains like the main options used to actually submit this, uh, the next flow command. So Speakeasy is the, uh, I don't even think I mentioned this, but Speakeasy is the uh, next flow, flow based tool. Um, so uh, I'll go into like show an example script in a second, but um, that just basically contains your main options. Um, and we support a couple of different, um, a few different environments. So these shell, like shell scripts are supposed to be able to run like out of the box for a, um, a system managed with either Slurm or SGE to like um, job uh, schedulers that are common on like HPCs. Uh, but you can also run um, just on a Linux based machine um, if you want to. Um, yeah, so then there's also a configuration file that I've been mentioning a little bit, which has sort of like more detailed options. Um, so um, yeah, a lot you can configure there. Um, so yeah, we'll take a look at, um, actually I'll kind of skip that part for a second, but basically the, um, the, the main script will look a bit like this. Hopefully this is big enough. Um, but essentially, uh, I mean, you can put whatever arguments at the top that uh, work for your like, in this case, we use an SGE based um, uh, a cluster, so there's a lot of options for how to submit the job, but really the core of this is the um, just invoking Nextflow and calling Speakeasy, and then some options like if your um, data is paired end or single end, um, the reference genome. So in this case, like this is for mouth, mouse, um, MM10, and strandness, and then other um, options just about like where to place outputs, and um, that's really most of it. Um, so, and yeah, more of the detailed options, like um, like which version of the reference you want, like which ensemble release or gen code re release, those are located in the config file, not the main script. But um, those should really be the two files that you need to um, work with before you run Speakeasy. Um, you have to have those reference files for you? Yes, uh, yeah, so that's all automatic. We support. Um, Gen code and ensemble for human mouse and uh, um, rat. So, and then yeah, you can specify the version, the like release from those websites. And it part of the workflow is downloading those um, those files, and then it caches it for the future run, so you don't have to like keep downloading. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, will there will there be eventual support for uh, cloud-based executors in the AWS batch? Um. We probably could, uh, I, yeah, we probably could do that. So in theory, Nextflow makes that kind of thing fairly easy. Um, yeah, if that's like a feature people 
or be interested in, like I think it's would be fairly easy to implement. So yeah, definitely do that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any? Or actually, one one more thing. <laughs> um, so submitting the job, um, you can just do however it works for your um, your system. So if it's a cluster managed by these um, um, job schedulers like Slurm, it's, you just dispatch this main script or um, SGE queue sub it. Uh, a local machine, you just invoke it as a normal shell script, and so it's fair, that part is fairly simple. Um, um, yeah, so that's, I guess, this is the component of the talk that the workshop that involves speakeasy. So if you have any questions, um, we can take those or we can move on to our next piece. <laughs> Do you have it or could it be easily made if someone has already got the reference files? For example, like my compute cluster, the compute nodes are walled off of the internet so you can't download it. Yeah. Um, so we actually did have a collaborator who had the same situation where they um, their compute nodes didn't have internet as well. So we, um, I can't remember if we maintained this, but it was a, we did develop a script to basically um, perform all the steps in a place where you did have internet and then you can run speakeasy without internet. Um, another option that would probably be, you'd probably be interested in is we do support like custom annotation. You can provide your own annotation files and then skip the step that normally pulls it. So yeah, we do support that. Um, I almost never just plainly use human mouse or rat. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those species I'm always usually adding something else into it, so I've got to have a custom annotation. Uh, yeah, we do, it, I guess to be, to be clear, we do have we do only use those three species, but within those species, because we hard code some things like how many chromosomes for the species, and but in terms of reference files, it's pretty flexible um, within those species. Um, yeah, if there's anything else, or we can. Uh, yeah, I guess we can move on to the. Um, okay, so once we have a view how to use the speakeasy and what it is, now we can start with an example using the speakeasy pipeline outputs um, in a differential expression analysis. So to do that, we're going to be uh, using a data set from the smoking mouse package that I presented yesterday, in case you were there. Uh, but basically, um, we will download the RSEG object from the smoking mouse package that contains the expression, the gene expression levels, the, the counts for genes um, from this experiment in which they were adult mice that were administered nicotine or they were controls. They were all females, but some were pregnant and the rest were not. And pups were born to the pregnant mice that were either nicotine exposed or nicotine controls. And brain samples were taken from all, all of them. In total, there were 65 samples for this experiment. RNA sequencing experiments were performed, so at the end we have the gene expression counts in these summarized experiment objects presented. So um, the data reside, as I told you, in this branch summarized experiment object, and it contains these two assays. The first one is the counts that contains the original read counts, the raw data for more than 55,000 mouse genes across 208 samples, including the 65 nicotine samples of interest for this example. And the log counts are, are the normalized and scale counts. And then um, we have in raw data, the gene information, and in cold data, the sample information. In yellow, we have the variables that correspond to the speakeasy outputs, the ones that we, we will be using because there are many more and in pink variables that are specific for this study, uh, such as the simple metadata, and in blue, some other quality control metrics that I computed using upper cell QC of the SCUDL package. So um, initially for the genes, we have gene code, the ensemble ID, the identifier uh, in NZBI entries database for each gene, and also the official gene symbol. This is all returned by SPKC. And then we have this other variable retained after fetal filtering that is a Boolean variable that equals true if a gene passes the gene filtering step or false if not. And then as part of sample information, we have, of course, a sample ID. We have this ERCC sum log error that is a summary statistic that quantifies the overall difference of expected um, versus the observed concentrations of RNA 
control, the control RNAs for each sample. The overall map rate, that is a decimal fraction of reads that successfully map to the reference genome. The mitomap, that is a number of reads that successfully map to the mitochondrial chromosome. Um, total map is a number of reads that successfully map to the canonical sequences, sequences in the reference genome. Then we have mitorate, that in this case is the, the, the decimal fraction of reads that map to the mitochondrial chromosome of those that map at all. Total assigned gene is the fraction of reads that map to the to, to genes. And ribosomal RNA rate, that is a fraction of reads that as, were assigned to the genes whose type was ribosomal RNA. And this is all returned by SPKC. Then we have some other particular variables, such as the tissue from which the sample comes, or the age of the mice, the sex, the type of experiment. In this case, we are only interested in nicotine experiment. The group that is a variable of interest because it separates the samples by nicotine exposed versus nicotine control samples. We have the plate that uh, was um, the plate in which a sample library was prepared. Uh, pregnancy, the sample comes from a pregnant or not pregnant mice. Um, the medium in which a sample was treated, the flow cell that was the sequencing patch. And finally, we have some undetected. Some is a library size for each sample, and detected is a number of expressed genes. Um, okay, so in this part of the code, you can see how to download the data. We need the summar we need to load the summarized experiment package and also experiment hub. So we load the data set by using this code and we extract the, the data set of interest that, that contains the gene expression codes. Uh, so at the end you can if you're running this code, you can see that you can check that the classes are run summarized experiment. And as I told you, um, this data set contains more than 200 samples for the, smoke, um, the smoking and nicotine experiment, but we only care about the nicotine experiment. So we have to extract the data of interest, and that's what we're doing in this part, so that we end up with 55 samples. And we can access the gene expression data. This is just exploring the sample data with call data. And yeah, here we have all the QZ metrics that we will be using. So um, the idea is to perform a differential expression analysis with all this information. So um, basically, we will be performing these steps that are here from the, the second, third, and fourth steps. Initially, there is a data preparation step in which we normalize, filter the data, and we can also separate samples. But this is already, um, we already have that information in the data set, in the Ranch Maris experiment objects, normalized cones, and also a variable to extract the, the genes that pass the filtering step. Um, then we will be performing the, the exploratory data analysis um, with the quality control analysis and also exploring sample level effects with principal component analysis and exploring the gene level effects with variance partition. We will be modeling and comparing differentially, exp differentially expressed genes and visualizing their expression patterns. So uh, as part of data preparation, we will not be normalizing or filtering genes. But as you know, it is important, um, just as a reminder, that the data normalization is important because the expression, the raw cones are not necessarily reflecting the real expression measures of the genes because there are these technical differences in the ways the, the libraries were prepared in sequence and also differences in the land and GC content of the genes. So um, that's what it is important. And also there are differences between samples, such as the sequencing depth, the number of molecules that, was, that were sequenced, and the library sizes. So um, in, in this assay, low cons, we have cons per million, which is basically um, a basic unit of normalization in which the, the cons for a gene of samples are normalized by the library size of a sample per million. So we have this simple formula here. And the way I performed that was using Coldmore factors from the HR package, in which um, it applies the train mean of n values. That was the default method that assumes, assumes that most of the genes are not differentially expressed. And at the end, we receive um, the cons per million plus 0.5 in a logarithmic scale. Um, so we can check here in this histogram the distribution of the cones without being normalized and filtered. We can see that most of them are zeros. And once we normalize the data, we can see that the cones are more widespread. 
but it is until we filter the, the non-expressed genes, the lowly or zero expressed genes, that we, we, we are closer to a normal distribution. Um, okay, so now we can pass to the exploratory data analysis. In this case, we will be performing first the quality control, quality control analysis, um, which is important with all these variables that the SPKC pipeline returns because you know that there are technical and methodological differences in the steps during the experimental stages, such as in the um, sampling, the RNA extraction in different batches, the sequencing in different fossil, et cetera. So we have all these potential sources of variation and we need to uh, account for them and also to, to compare the quality of the matrix and, sorry, the, qual the, the quality matrix of the samples in different sample groups or to, to detect particular um, isolated problematic samples. And another important question is why do we care about mitochondrial and ribosomal cones as matrix? And that's because in, during the process of mRNA extraction, either by mRNA enrichment, capturing polyadenylated mRNAs, or by the, removing ribosomal RNA, we will expect to have a low number of cones that map to ribosomal RNAs, to the genes of those RNAs, or to um, the mitochondrial chromosome. So if you have higher rates of this cones, a miter, miter rate or a ribosomal RNA rate, that implies a poor quality in the samples. And just as a note, all these QC metrics um, were computed using the unprocessed data sets. That's neither filter nor normalized because we want to capture and preserve the original estimates of the samples. Okay, so uh, with these QC metrics, the first thing that we can do is create box plots to compare the, these values for different groups of samples. Right, so this is what I'm doing here in this far, first part of the code. I'm defining the QZ matrix of interest for the Y axis in the box plots and the sample variables for the X axis just to separate the samples. Um, I'm defining here the colors, the labels, and I'm using ggplot to create this type of plots in which we have the QZ matrix here. And um, in this case, for a single variable, sample variable such as H, I'm plotting all the QZ metrics. So for example, here we can appreciate that the miter rate is lower in the pups than in the adults, but total assigned gene is higher. So those type, those this type of differences are the ones that we, we want to detect with this, creating these box plots. Um, then for group, importantly, the variable of interest that separates controls versus experimental samples, we can see that the QZ metrics are evenly distributed. They are not big differences, which is something good. Um, we can do the same for the rest of the variables, such as the plate in which the libraries were prepared for each sample. And we can see, again, there are not dramatic differences. And the same thing for the flow cell in which the libraries were sequenced. Um, okay, so that's the type of things that we can detect. And once we have detected the differences, we want to get rid of problematic groups of samples or to detect uh, like what are the outliers, which samples are outliers based on these QZ metrics. So we can use is outlier function to filter samples by quality. This function is part of this cutter package. And basically what we what it does is to find outlier samples based on these QZ metrics, the ones that have, that are, that have a QZ metric three median absolute deviations away from the median. And uh, what I decided to do was to take initially all the samples together from the Rancho Myers experiment object. And here with this outlier, we can, uh, with this argument type, we can indicate if we want to detect outliers in the lower or the higher end, depending on the QC metric. And we can see that after this QC sample filtering, 39 samples were kept. So we removed like uh, 26 samples, taking all samples together, that is for adults and pups. But when I just subset to adult samples, 20 samples were kept. And when I do the same for pop samples only, 41 samples are kept. But once we have done that, it is always important to trace the QZ metrics of the filtered samples, right? To, to know what we have, we, what, how we removed to verify that they are really poor quality because a sample that is an outlier is not necessarily poor quality and vice versa. So to check that, we can create um, with this code, this type of plots, right, in which we now color the samples by either if they were dropped or retained after this process of QC filtering. 
And this is for the, the first analysis in which I took all the samples together, adult and pups. And we can see in red the samples that were taken as outliers and were dropped. And as you can appreciate, they were all from the adults in mitorate. And that is because as we appreciated in the initial box plot, the mitorate was very different between adults and pups. But of course, this is not desirable because we also want to study the adult samples, so we don't want to get rid, get rid of them. And that's the reason why we had to separate the samples by age and analyze them separately. So um, once, I, once we do that, for the adults, we can see that only three control samples are dropped by mitorate, the ones that are here. And for the pups, only one sample, one experimental sample is removed by its ribosomal RNA rate. So we can see that the rate is not pretty far from the rest. But we're going to take them as outliers just to simplify the analysis. Um, So yeah, once we have normalized the data and properly filter uh, all the features and samples, uh, the next step is to explore um, the variation in gene expression of the samples to identify if um, um, if any covariate explains a high proportion of the variance in the expression, in which case we will have to uh, control by that covariate. Uh, in a few words, yeah, if a variable represents a big difference in expression um, of the value of the samples. And first, uh, here I'm creating uh, some functions. This is to calculate uh, the PCAs with uh, PR comp. Um, and then uh, I'm just choosing the colors and uh, plotting the PCAs. And these plots are using uh, both, both uh, groups in, in age, which are pups and adults. And um, as we can see in this, uh, in this plot, um, the PC1 with the principal component number one is the one that's separating uh, adults and pups. And this confirms that we should be analyzing uh, the samples in b different groups uh, based on the, on the age. Uh, yeah, once we also here I'm plotting all the other uh, sample variables, which are control and experimental, uh, the sex of the samples, uh, and yeah, pregnancy and that kind of stuff. Obviously, uh, when we take both of the age groups, these kind of plots sometimes does not make sense because the adults are both uh, the same sex. So yeah, and yeah. So yeah, in pups, uh, sex segregate samples in PC2, which um, could have biological interpretations. Uh, so that's why we must adjust for this covariate in the models for differential expression analysis. These are the plots for uh, PCAs uh, in the pups. And um, we also see other interesting stuff. In stuff. Uh, for example, that the pups are not separated by the plate or the flow cell, which is good because that means we don't have uh, that kind of bias. Um, and a similar thing uh, with the adults. Um, okay, so once we have explored the sample level effects, we can now explore the gene level effects, which is basically a variance prediction analysis um, uh, in which we quantify the contribution of multiple sample variables of the study, the, the sample in the sample metadata, in the gene expression variation that constitutes one of the fundamental challenges when analyzing RNA seq data. So to do that, um, we need to compute the fraction of variance that is explained, the variance in gene expression, by each variable of our study. But after, before that, we have to assess if there are correlated variables in the sample metadata, because there are at least two problems if that's the case. If two variables are correlated, we could incorrectly conclude that one of them contributes to gene expression changes, 
when in reality it is just correlated with a real contributory variable. And also, if the variable of interest in this example group is correlated with another technical variable or whatever, um, the contribution of that biologically relevant variable could be reduced by the apparent contribution of the correlated variables. So we need to identify which variables are correlated and then decide which one, which ones to keep and which ones to remove. To do that, we, we will be performing a canonical correlation analysis with Concord pairs from the Barnes partition package um, that enables to compare, uh, to measure the, the variation, uh, yeah, like the correlation between two categorical variables or continuous variables or one categorical versus one continuous. So that's what we're doing here which is basically to apply this function here, can compares with a formula with the, the variables and the data. So this is a result, this is for the adults, and we can clearly see that there's a correlation, a high correlation between the sum that is the library size and detected, that is the number of expressed genes for each sample. There's also a high correlation between mitre rate and total assigned gene, and also between overall map rate, plate, and flow cell. And for the pub, something similar uh, is observed. Some and detected are correlated here, and also overall map rate and ribosomal RNA rate with plate and flow. Uh, importantly, in both the adults here for group and in pubs, group is not correlated with is not highly correlated with not, with any other variable, which is something good because um, if that were the case, we have to get rid of the correlated variables because we need to preserve this um, variable for differential expression analysis. Okay, so the next thing that we would like to explore is why these variables are correlated. So we can create bar plots, box plots, or scatter plots, depending on if the variables are continuous or categorical uh, for each part of correlated variables. So that's what we're doing here. Um, in this case, for example, for the adults, we have in this scatter plot the mitre rate in the x-axis and the total assigned gene in the y-axis, and the samples colored by the group. And we can see that there, there are these variables here with high mitre rates and low total assigning, which are full quality samples here. But importantly, we can see that the control and experimental samples are evenly distributed, so there's no like a difference. There's not a group in a, by, by the group. Uh, we also saw that there was a correlation between flozil and plate, which is not expected because these are two technical variables. But where it is a stack bar plot, we can see that that could be given because um, all the samples from the first flow cell here in um, here in the x-axis are from come from the we're also in the first plate in orange, and almost all the samples from the second flow cell were in the third plate. So those type of things we can we can detect, and then in, in adults we also saw the correlation between the library size here and the detected number of genes. Again, uh, we don't see a separation in, by by group. And in the pops, we saw the same type of correlation for the same two variables, some and detected. And importantly, we can see that the controls overall have bigger numbers of expressed genes, probably. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what we can see here. And also in the pops, there was a correlation between the plate and the overall map rate. So we can create this type of box plot to observe why. Here we have these samples from the first plate that could be um, driving this correlation. Right, because they have lower overall map rate. Uh, and then uh, here in this part, um, for the adults, this is for adults, this is for pups. I'm presenting the number of samples that are controlled and experimentals and that were in the first, second, or, or third plate, or in the first, second, or third full cell. So we can see that all the samples, either controls or experimentals, are uh, distributed in all the plates and, and the flow cells. So the question would be, what do you think it is important that both experimental and control samples are distributed throughout all the plates and flow cells? Any ideas? Can you show the question again? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would be problematic if you have all the control samples in just one plate and all the experimental samples in another plate because uh, the group variable, the variable of interest, would be the same as the variable plate or fossil. Okay, 
Um, so we already know what, what, which variables are created. So now we have to decide which ones to keep, which ones to drop. So to do that, we are gonna feed a model for the gene expression for each gene and compute the fraction of variance that is explained by each variable in the sample metadata. And for that, we're gonna be, we will use the variance partition function that fits a linear model for each gene separately. And Kalberg part, this function computes the fraction of variance in gene expression explained by each variable. Uh, and also computes the contribution of the residual variation. Uh, so basically what it does is to calculate and compute the, variant, the data variance given by each variable and also the variance that is explained by the total model fit, taking all the variables together. Um, and what it does, variance partition fits to types of models, a linear mixed model or all categorical variables are modeled as random effects and all continuous variables are modeled as fixed effects. And this function here is used to fit that model. But for a uh, fixed effects model, um, variance partition fits a standard linear model where all categorical variables are simply modeled as fixed effects. And LM function is used to do that. Um, so what are the random and fixed effects and how do you define if a variable is one or the other? The categorical variables are usually modeled as random effects. Uh, we can think of them as these traits such, such as the box, batch, the sex, flows, or pedor. These individual variables that are randomly chosen from a population um, in which we are, we are not really interested in the specific levels of a variable, but in the grouping of the samples by the variable. And on the other hand, the continuous variables must be modeled as fixed effects uh, because these correspond to variables that are somehow measurable and because the levels are themselves of interest and the effects are considered to be the same for all the genes. That's why we call them fixed effects. And this distinction is important because if we have a cluster data in the gene expression by sex played as we previously saw by sex and, um, for the pops, we will be violating the relevant assumption of independence and we will be making an incorrect uh, inference using the general general linear model if we have this cluster data. So we need to take an, ex an extension of this model with a linear mixed model that contains both type of effects. Um, so in this part, I'm just fitting the model. This is a bar using the, the function of feed struct bar per model. It loops over each gene and feed the model, extract the variance that is explained by each variable for each gene. And at the end, we end up with this type of violin plots in which each dot is a gene. And in the y-axis, we have for each gene, the variance that is explained in the gene expression by each variable in the x-axis. And here, the residuals. So this is for the adults. And what we can observe is the total assigned gene has the biggest mean fraction of variance explained. These variables are ordered by the mean contribution. So with these plots, taking you know, all the variables, we can decide if we have two correlated variables, which one to keep, which one to drop. And based on that, without the correlated variables, this is the final plot for the adults. But also we must know that the residual contribution increments once we remove these correlated variables. Here, we can appreciate that it was like in 30 or something like that, the mean. And in this case, it is um, bigger than 50. And that's the price of the, if you remember the residual variance is the variance that the model was not able to explain. That's the price to pay um, when we remove correlated variables. And for the pop, something similar occurs. Here we can see the, the violin plot for the percentage of variance explained, taking all variables. And without the correlated variables, this is the final model, but the residual contribution increments. But this is, um, you know, with this, we have chosen which variables to include in the models for differential expression analysis so that we don't have correlated variables and, and incorrect results. So once we've decided uh, the variables to include on our differential expression analysis based on all uh, the QC analysis we've done and the uh, variance partition analysis, we can move to um, using Lima for the actual uh, modeling and differential expression analysis. And that's what we are doing with this function. Um, as we mentioned, we are uh, doing different analysis for, for adults and pups. Um, and then we're just using uh, the normal 
Lima uh, pipeline, uh, which first creates a model matrix uh, based on the formula with the variables we've decided, uh, then uh, transforms accounts uh, to look to, um, and then um, fits the linear model to each gene to estimate the log FCs. Uh, then it uh, computes the empirical bias statistics. And all of these uh, pipeline also outputs uh, this kind of plots. And what we want to see in here is uh, mostly these two plots. Um, this one is like the normal volcano plot we usually see in, uh, in papers. And this is the frequency of the adjusted p-value. Uh, normally you can plot these as adjusted p-value or also uh, p-value and when it's p-value you expect to see a flat line in here uh, when it happens is that uh, yeah the, the model it's likely working uh, and yeah these are the results for uh, the adults and we can see that we don't have any significant um, genes and uh, then for the pops uh, we do have uh, significant genes, and this is kind of where I'm talking about that we expect some like flat, uh, uh, like behavior of the frequency plot for the p values. And um, once we explore this result and seeing that our model is working, and yeah, that we don't have maybe too many variables, or that yeah, the model is not calculating. Uh, correctly at the adjusted p-values, we can uh, move on to identify which are the genes that are differential expressed in our uh, data set. And, okay, so this is just uh, code to plot, uh, this kind of plots. Uh, this is for the adults, and as I mentioned before, uh, there's no significant uh, differential express genes, but, uh, for the bobs, we can see all of these uh, differential express uh, genes. And um, also, once we have uh, seen the volcano plots, sometimes we want to uh, focus on a couple of genes uh, that we want to see the expression. And uh, in this part, it's important to also control uh, for the variables that we use in our formula. Or our formula because if we don't do that, uh, we're gonna see um, the we're gonna see the plots, but we're gonna see also the effect of these variables, and we we only want to see the effect of this one. And um, we can do also these kind of plots uh, showing uh, the expression of well the counts of of the genes. In this case, uh, this one is underexpressed in our experimental group. And um, this one is over express. And yeah, now that we have uh, computed all uh, the statistics for differential expressions, uh, we can compare the T stats uh, for the genes and the pups and the adults. And uh, when we do that, we get this kind of plots. Um, in this case, since we don't have significant genes in, in okay, I'm gonna explain this plot better. <laughs> um, so we have the t-stats in both uh, axes. Uh, in here, we have the t-stats for pups, and then we have the t-stats for adults. In this case, uh, for the pups, since we do have differential expressions, uh, we have in orange the significant uh, genes for the pups. And since we don't have, uh, differential expressions in adults, we don't see any coloring, but if we did, uh, we will see other other colors in here. And in the corners, we will see uh, the genes that were um, differential expressed in both groups. And yeah, after this, we can also do uh, other differential express uh, visualization and in the form of um, heat maps. And 
this is good because, um, for example, here we are using heatmap uh, from complex heatmap. Um, and it has this um, parameter, which is clustering. And as we can see, it's automatically clustering the bike group, which is what we expect. And also by um, the FC, which is up or uh, down regulated. So in this heat map, we have uh, these four groups. In this case, uh, we have the underexpressed genes in um, in a con sorry, yeah in the control and um, for the experimental. And in this case, it's the other way around. Um, okay, so just as a brief conclusion, the SpeakEasy pipeline offers this integrative, reproducible, and documented way to process the bulk RNA seq data from the FASTQs, um, the FASTQC files. And as we demonstrated with this workshop, this workflow returns the process objects for direct use in analysis of expression and quantification, the Rancho Myers experiment objects. And it provides this convenient and illuminating metrics for the QCA analysis and the exploration of all these gene level effects. Um, and yeah, I think that's all we have for today. If you have any questions or comments. I have. Yeah, I have a question. I probably missed this at the beginning, but is this only for like mammal genes or genomes? Can I apply these to other organisms? Or uh... you mean the SpeakEasy pipeline? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah for SpeakEasy, uh, it's just uh, human and have some rat right now. Can you speak on the mic? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so the question was if we could use this on like um, non mammal genomes and basically. Uh, for speakeasy, we can only, there's only really three species, a human, mouse, and rat right now. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So, so the speakeasy pipeline is actually the pipeline itself, which you can't show because we can't run it in, in this environment here. Yeah. And all the rest of the stuff you're showing here is, is an example analysis from the outputs of the speakeasy pipeline. Yeah, exactly. Can you pull up some of the, because I was trying to find, I couldn't see mm -hmm. where, like the scripts of the SpeakEasy pipeline and, or where would, if I want to go and use it, where do I find the documentation on what versions you're running, what arguments you're running, what, um, that sort of stuff um, in the pipeline? Yeah. Um, so just, uh, in case anyone, I think everyone heard that, but in case they didn't, um, just more, more information about SpeakEasy, like documentation, where it can be, um, where we can learn more about it. So I think we, I mean, we have time. We can, I think we can just show, basically it's just the SpeakEasy, SpeakEasy has its own repository. And um, from, if you just Google the repository for this, we, yep, that's, uh, I'll drop both the repo. Um, yeah, the links on the, on the vignette itself, right? Uh, I think so, I think we did. If, if not, that was a mistake. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll provide it in the chat in case we, um, uh, this is not the right window. Sorry, I'm like getting lost here. Um, is it, it's the other tab on this window. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, so we're dropping the repository for Speakeasy and also the question was about the documentation website, which I will send the link for, and then we can actually dive into it for a bit. Um, oh, I already forgot where, okay. There we go. Did that not copy? Oh, copy, okay. Um, yeah, so we do have a documentation website, um, which we try to include things like, so in terms of pipeline components, I think was one piece of the question. Uh, well, we have like a visual of the workflow, um, which I showed, but then also, um, there is um, a section about um, like actually every single step here. So um, uh, the purpose of the step and, and um, what kind of tools are used in terms of um, if you want like a more 
compact table of like what software is used and stuff like that. Um, that would be in this component. So um, I guess every, these are really the dependencies uh, in terms of like what Docker images we use. So these are things that we host and they're automatically downloaded, but in case you're curious about actual exact versions, um, the information is here on our website. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I missed another that covers your question. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So the workshop Galaxy server is hosting R 4.30, which mm -hmm. uh, corresponds to an experiment of snapshot backdated to April. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So because the folks uh, um, who updated that is from July of this year. Uh, you can't actually load it on the workshop instance. Okay. Um, it might have been it because I feel like we. So that has to do with like um, it's a recent submission as Milky Mouse, um, and it's approved for Biconductor Cree 18. So you can only access it from the Biconductor Develop version. Got it. Not Cree 17 is the Biconductor release, so that's why you can only see files from April when. 317 was made public. Um, there there so, might have been a way that when we sent it out, we said we wanted you to use the release version, unless there was a compelling reason why you needed to. But I think it might have been too late by, by that point to switch the workshop over to the developers. So the, the website that they were showing was built with 318. That's how we did it with GitHub Actions. But. Okay, thank you. Ask questions all day, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I guess so. Just back to your analysis. Um, I mean, that was it was it was a good. I have some specific questions about the specific analysis that you did in here, kind of also with the idea of why you decided to split the adults from the pups, but then at the end you're comparing the t values for the particular thing. So why can't you? Even if you you can't, and I understand why you couldn't. You know, it's not appropriate to do a direct comparison. Any between any of the pups and any of the adults, but you can still do the interaction test and actually have a statistical test rather than, oh, well, look, this t value was significant, and this t value um, t sat wasn't. So, can you speak to that about why you decided to separate? Yeah, well, basically, because uh, you know, here we saw that I think there are two main reasons um, because here if we take them together as, just, as we previously saw we will be removing all the adult samples right so um, because of the mitre rate here in the box box we, we observed that they are they have these very different mitre, mitochondrial rates so based on the way we filter the samples uh, by the QZ metrics and detecting outliers if we take all the samples together both the adult and pups all the adult samples are taken as outliers so we will be removing them and so how many total samples here did you have um they are 65 for yeah okay so i mean i did think this was interesting these are quality control scores that i typically might look at for single cell data but i never look at it in bulk yeah. Um, mainly because I'm only working with six samples or 12 samples. So, mm -hmm. um, so do you think that the type of QC and filtering thresholds that you can do change depending on the number of samples that you have? Um, yeah, I mean, we only used uh, this threshold with the three median absolute deviations. We didn't try with other ones, but probably would be a good idea. Yeah, so you do need more samples. Yeah. Like otherwise, the, the ease outlier function with only six samples, it's yeah. not really meant for just six. Yeah. But no. It's meant for a lot more. Yeah, no, we had the question in, uh, we did our pre conference workshop about, well, outliers, can you computationally detect them? And I'm like, not just, when you've got three replicates per group. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so I just thought that was. Um, because and even like so the uh, and it wasn't quite follow all the stuff about the 
partition and variation. So even after doing like a boom correction or something where you're taking into it, you still see effects of sequencing depth on the resulting gene expression. Yeah, yeah, we can see that here. Sorry. These plots. But um, that's also why we share these data set on Experiment Hub, because like the full data set is over 200 samples, which is kind of rare for bulk currency seeking in a lot of ways. Um, and so we think it can be useful for also teaching, because um, you can subset the data in different ways and do all these QC metrics. Yeah, I mean, it was good, except no one does those, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, nobody does it. I, I have very few that come through that have even five replicates per group. Um, but then again, it can get This is sum is the the library size. The library size. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because I just also saw your final model and everything that you put in it, and you never have nearly enough degrees of freedom to have many in. Okay, more questions or? It's like uh, during your linear mixed model explanation, there are like two code sums, one uh, you're fitting LMM and the other was just plain LM. And you also mentioned that for your categorical variables, you always choose random effects, right? So. Uh, that is because you're saying like you're not interested in how these um, variables like sex or batch like affect gene expression. But if you did have a categorical variable um, that you were interested in, you would fit that as a mixed effect instead. Uh, no, what I mean with that is, for example, play that is categorical one, two, or three. Like we don't care about the number one, two, or three, but we care about the separation of the samples by this variable that is categorical. So that's. Like the reason, like we can think of them as we randomly pick the plate for the samples, though it was not necessarily random. But that's what they recommend in the user guide for of variance partition to take all categorical variables as if they were random effects. Um, so another way of saying is we don't care about like the, the one unit increment in plate from one to two to two to three. Mm -hmm. Just about like groups, you can think of them as groups A, B, and C instead of one, two, and three. So this was all part of a lot of a larger course. We have a link near the end. I think we skipped over it. Mm, yeah, here. Um, so this was a four-day course where we teach a lot other things. Okay, and did you walk through actually how did you walk through Speakeasy Park? Uh, not there. We didn't really run it. Okay. Yeah. Have you had lots of people? Um, we, we think so. We need to do actually. Um, yeah, I so we think so. We know of at least like some people have asked. I don't, we probably need to do a better job of like analytics and seeing how many people actually like clone the repo and stuff like that. So we haven't really been keeping careful track of exact numbers, but like, um, Within like collaborate like close collaborators, we um, we know use it, and so it's growing a little bit. Yeah. We know about bugs. Huh? We know about bugs when people have a bug. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's always when they yell at you. This climber, not warranting anything or any of the outputs of this. <laughs> I can maybe go just maybe a little bit more on certain pieces of speakeasy since we have time. Um, so I guess since you asked a question about 
custom annotation. Um, there is a section in the documentation that says like how you go about doing that. Uh, essentially, like you, um, there's like this annotation argument. Um, you just prov provide a directory with uh, some files that Speakeasy expects. So that includes like the um, the FOSTA file for the reference genome, um, G the GTF that contains like annotation about genes, and then um, since we also do transcript quantification, uh, I guess a FOSTA associated with that has all those transcripts for. Um, yeah, but again, you you are, this is all coded, assuming you because you like make sure it has a string assembly in the file you've kind of coded this to ensemble um uh no i don't think so i mean i think there is um yeah there's certain rules for sure that you have to follow but i don't yeah. there's no reason you couldn't use a um um that i can think of off the top of my head that you couldn't use another type of uh, I, I found out the hard way that you know like 10x genomics their single cell they're like, oh yeah, you can use custom reference, but they're so hard coded to how Ensemble and Genco format their files that NTBI files fail without like six or seven modifications. Oh, um, you know, so, like I, translation of the question is like NCBI they call chromosomes with just the numbers, right? So that's the NCBI style. Of no, like, NCBI has a species specific genome, specific, or, yeah, species specific chromosome like, specific ID that is not one, two, or CHR1, CHR2. Right. Um, the use of the chromosome IDs. Yeah. So in the bioconductor world, we have the genome info DB package, mm -hmm. right? That translates like the UCSC style without the CHR, and then the other style it has. Yeah, that's the it. NCBI is completely different. You have to have for each species, you have your own uh, file mapping from the kind of common name to their database specific, species specific. Uh, so I don't know, Nick, if you think that could break speakeasy. Yeah, you know, we just, I guess one problem is we haven't really tested. Um, we really have stuck to Gen Code and um, Ensemble when testing. So in theory, yeah. But, I didn't think of them, but what do you, so you said you pull everything out into the um, uh, uh, row ranges, and you mm -hmm. stick it out as the G ranges. So that's good. But what are you using in the other things as your row names for the genes? Ensembles? Uh, ensemble to make it to make sure it's unique. Uh, okay, but you are using ensemble. Uh, so it would have been pulled from the, um, the standard would have been the um, gene underscore ID attribute in a GTF file. I believe it is, yeah. Um, okay. That's fine because we're so into broke is that because NCBI files don't have symbols in the gene underscore name attribute, it's just the gene attribute. <laughs> Yeah, there's like a lot of a lot of like but, tiny subtle differences between IDs and well, yeah, and so yeah, yeah so that's the question about how it. Yeah, so where where I problem my problem where I fall is that a lot of these nice tools and everything are built for the bulk of what everybody does, right. chin in our mouse and one or the other, and I rarely handle that data. I handle custom data of all sorts of different species, and so. Which is why I intimately know the details of the GTF file. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's put together and like how you figure out what's in there and how to modify it. Yeah, I guess that is an area we haven't explicitly tested. And like, if there's, an issue, I mean, we'd be happy to try to make that work. Like, yeah, anyone can. Can you in in your um, can you pull up just one of the files where you you know or your your config file? Yeah. Because um, I'm just wondering, like, how you know, do you have do you just can we send in more than exon and you know specify a different type of exon and a different uh, attribute to count on than gene underscore ID? Do you allow those to propagate through? Um, so let's see. We use feature counts for um, counting like each of those types of features. So I guess what we do is um, maybe I'll actually pull up a. Um, I think Jenny's asking about like, can you configure? What fields of the GTF file contain what information we use? I don't think it's because he has that. Because, um, like, a lot of them, I know I don't, I don't really use HiSet 2, but I would be surprised if it's different because it's pretty standard, you know, like star and feature counts and all these other ones that the default feature type is Exxon, and then the default attribute name that you count on is gene underscore ID. Oh. Um, but those allow you to change it, but those are the expected defaults. And so I'm wondering, can you propagate through? Are you just using your defaults or can you propagate through if you want to change what's being counted on? 
Right. Um, so you can pass pretty much arbitrary command line arguments to the tools that like underlying each process. So that includes feature counts. Um, so if feature counts has like a command line argument that controls those things, then yes. Um, okay. So where would you say that, hey, here's a, an optional command line argument for feature counts, but you don't want to throw it into when you're running star or high set two or something like that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of a config file we use on our cluster, but um, there's base config files for like Slurm, SG, yeah. Um, but so I think this is what you're looking for. <laughs> um, um, gene arms. Yeah, so we have for counting genes and for counting exons, we use different command line arguments to the actual feature counts command. Um, and so, I, yeah, I haven't really ta like tampered with using custom. <laughs> So I would probably have to check the documentation on that to be give a really good answer here. But um, in theory, I think you could do what you were interested in. And so, yeah, so then the, the extra. I don't want to say the extra part, but again, there's also like NF core RDC pipelines and yeah. running stuff. So, but your addition onto this is that once you get through the accounts, you can pull it in and you can turn it out, spit it out, and summarize experiments. Yeah, that was our that was definitely our motivation for making this pipeline. I don't I haven't seen other pipeline like there are a lot of pipeline tools for sure, uh, but I, I don't think there are other ones that really use the focus on that summarize experiment output. Yeah. So then what? Is that the only output, or is it everything there? Um, we can, yeah. Let, let's uh, go into the outputs. Um, so, yeah, like the, I would say the summarized experiment is the main focus usually. But um, if you're doing, I did mention like if you're doing expressed regions type of analysis, um, it had like big wig files and. Um, yeah. Does it retain and output bad files if I want to go and then? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, these are like the main outputs, but then um, let's see. Uh, I have it for sure. I have it. Yeah, intermediary outputs. So um, yeah, all there's since there's so many components, it does keep the outputs from each step. So yeah, QC stuff, um, alignment, um, and a lot of those things are like a lot of the key metrics are aggregated and put into the summarized experiment. That's the goal. But um, yeah, definitely we have the peer outputs from each process. Do you have any checks? So it's funny. So you went past QC, mm -hmm. but then you just keep going through, you know, the whole pipeline. Yes, yes. So and, and nowadays the sequencing data is so nice and so beautiful. I hardly ever and our sequencing center go ahead and does the trimming, so I don't really ever have to do anything. Like before, it'd be like, oh, it's really bad. I need to do quality trimming, or I need to do this or that. Do you? Um, yeah. So do you get reports on that? Do you get flags if you had a sample that? Yeah. That sort of stuff? Um, so I guess the one way that FastQC um, outputs are actually directly used to make a decision is that by by default, like the adapter content metric is used to determine whether samples are trimmed. Okay. Um, that'd be one way. And then, yeah, for the most part, the rest of that information is just kind of collected and you just move on. Um, and then the idea is that if there are, um, I guess once you get the outputs, you can Test whether things need to filter or drop. Yeah, so you don't, um, or what are you using? Has to be a traumatic or if it has to trim? Uh, Trimmatic, yeah. yeah. Is it also also stuck in there to do quality trimming? Um, if it gets trimmed or not? Is it just trimming adapters? Um, I think we do both by default, but then uh, we do, like, yeah, in the configuration, you can directly control. Um, okay. Yeah, qual so by yeah. default, we do, but. Try to make it as flexible as possible. Um, does it matter if it's paired end or single end? Um, so we use uh, for trim, like trimming purposes. No, no, that your what you're sending it doesn't matter if it's paired end or single end. Oh, that's just that's a setting that you provide on the command line. Like um, it's like dash dash sample paired or dash dash sample single. Um, Okay, just, just, just you know, it's like some of the defaults. 
if I'm only coming in with 100 base pair long, 75 seems pretty long, you know, that uh, to trim it, 70, if, if it's lower than, if it ends up smaller than 75 after trimming, you're getting rid of it, seems a little extreme if I'm only coming in with 100 base pair long read. But if I'm coming in with two by 150 reads, then 75 seems a little bit more. Yeah, I think. If I remember correctly, that's we did develop it with like the two by one fifty idea in mind. Um, but well, again, I, I, it, no, it's, it gets back to the okay. We want to make something easy for you know, people to use by glossing over or just picking bot values for all of these things. Mm -hmm. Which again, you said it so that for the most part, you're coming in with human data that it has this and it'll work all fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a challenging balance to pick like sensible defaults, but then not allow people to configure it as well. I mean, we tried to allow both, but it's always a tricky challenge. Yeah, I know, but every tool is tricky. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah.